Blossoms, Draymer here at the homestead with the Hardcore Castle and today I am working on fields. Remember back in episode 9, ages ago, I said I needed to plough and plant, what was it, 586 chunks in order for the villagers over there to meet their obligations and have enough food to survive. I've got just over 180 left to go, I think. But when we were talking about how many chunks did I need to plough and plant, I didn't talk about how that was done. I think we need to fix that today. I'll just put this bucket in. What I'm doing right now is, I mean it's pretty familiar, it's just Minecraft ploughing and planting. One, two, three, four, five. Make sure you've got one block for every nine by nine square so that everything is hydrated and you can plant seeds. Easy enough, but I wouldn't have been doing this in medieval times. I don't do this in real life, let's face it. This farmer isn't very good at weeding. So what would they have done? It's not the big open fields with the monoculture that we've got now with combine harvesters going through. Let's pick that up. It wasn't the sort of pictures of fields that we're used to seeing when we think English fields, which is compartmentalised fields surrounded by hedgerows. Yes, there were hedgerows, I've got some in, but it wasn't what we think in our heads. It was this sort of thing. The open field system. Large tracts of land, um, some hedgerows, but the land itself was divided into strips. Each strip was assigned to a family and families might have more than one strip to attend to. I'm not sure what this crop is. I mean we've got beets and carrots, we've got barley. Um, maybe this is some sort of legume. It's actually grass but you know, humour me. <laughs> The strips were about 200 metres long, which is a furlong or furrow long, and they were between 5 or just under 5 and 20 metres wide. 20 metres is a chain. And not coincidentally, a strip that is a furlong by a chain is exactly one acre. Now, my strips are slightly wider than that, they're 24 which I have done specifically to make it easy for me to calculate how many chunks I have ploughed and planted. Excuse me a minute, let's find some land where I can put down my bed. Oh, that's looking good. There's stuff going on over there I can't show you just yet. So let's head down to my demonstration field so I can show you. This system of strips with the ploughing was called ridge and furrow or rig and furrow, and it was created by the method by which the farmers ploughed are. We're going to have to go round the long way. Now my demonstration field is half a furlong, just to make it easier to show you so that it can more easily be rendered and you can see what's happening. This is better. Okay, so ridge and furrow, or rig and furrow. So a medieval plough could only go in one direction. The ploughshare and the mouldboard were arranged in such a way that it would tip all sods to the right. The ploughman would begin in the middle of the strip and would plough in as straight a line as possible. When you got to the end, turn around the oxen and the plough, arrange yourself so that you are standing to the left of the furrow that you have just ploughed and plough back up the field. Now again, the sod is tipped into the right, so into the centre, and the first row and the row you've just made form a small peak. When you get to the end you turn around again, and again you arrange the plough so that you are to the left, and you plough down the strip again. And you keep doing this in clockwise elongated loops that gradually get further and further apart as you plough the strip. Once it was all done, just walk up and down the furrows, planting the seeds. Now the reason this is called ridge and furrow is the first time you plant a field, it's fairly flat. 
and that's what it'll always be like in Minecraft. I I can mark it out like Ridge and Furrow, but I can't simulate what it does, not easily anyway. Over the years, the decades, the centuries of ploughing Ridge and Furrow, stacking all the sods in towards the centre, you ended up with the strip forming a ridge and the unploughed space between being a furrow between the strips. And the difference in height between the middle of the strip and the furrow could be anything from 60 to 200 centimetres. That's two metres. Now, as you can see, I have still got some hedgerows in, but if they're not dividing the fields up, what were they for? 50% of the hedgerows that exist in Britain now were planted between the 17th and 19th century when the Parliament introduced multiple acts of enclosure. I'm not a fan of the acts of enclosure. It closed off common land from the people, turning it over to the sole use of rich landholders. And a lot of those landholders turned it from cropping land to grazing land. Regardless of the hardship that that caused, the farmers, the general population, they didn't care. A benefit to us of the acts of enclosure was that as farming practices changed, as ploughing practices changed, there were parcels of land in Britain where ridge and furrow was preserved in the landscape. It was turned over to grazing, but you can see the marks of it. And I've got a picture of it on the screen now. That was taken by Kev the Dev in Lanarkshire up in Scotland. And you can clearly see why it's called ridge and furrow. Now, yes, I said acts of enclosure, not acts of enclosure. An enclosure keeps something in. So this is a cow enclosure. An enclosure keeps something out. In this case, ordinary people from land that they and their ancestors had been working for a very long time indeed and that they relied upon. So if hedgerows in medieval times weren't largely being used for enclosing, what were they being used for? Well, first I want to say some of them were being used for enclosure. The Statute of Merton in 1235, passed under Edward III, allowed the lords of the manor to enclose common land so long as they provided enough for their tenants' needs. Guess who chose what was enough? It wasn't the villagers, I'll tell you that. Huh. Richard I and John also did a bit of enclosing, but it wasn't until oh, late Tudor times that it really came back into vogue and then from the 1600s onward really built up steam. Back to medieval hedgerows. Sorry, the acts of enclosure actually make me really, really angry. <laughs> medieval hedgerows. Well, some of them weren't medieval. Some of them went back to the Bronze Age. There had been hedgerows in particular places in England from the Bronze Age. Others dated from Anglo-Saxon times, and then we've got the medieval ones. What were they for? Boundary markers of estates, parishes, that sort of thing. The remnants of cleared forest or woodland. We've cleared up to this amount. We haven't cleared that. That's the bit that's left. They were used as windbreaks. They were used for animal management. That's why I've left the hedgerows in here, I've got them for animal management. I'm thinking of putting some on this other side of the road, although there's not a lot of passive mobs that spawn in this little strip, so we'll see. But that's it, that's what hedgerows were for, that's how fields were planted, that's medieval farming. One of the great things about Ridge and Furrow, all that rain in Britain, I mean Shakespeare didn't write the rain it raineth every day for no reason, the rain hits the ridge, the water all runs off into the furrows and your plants don't have rotted roots. Great for drainage. I've still got a oh, fair bit of planting to do, but nowhere near as much, about 184 chunks. Wish me luck. <laughs> we'll get back to the castle next episode.